little bit over time. So without more ado, I'm going to welcome Chris Aitchison, who's going to talk to you. Uh, Chris is from the University of Cincinnati. Um, he is also the chairperson of the International Association of Geoscience Diversity. And I'm sure we'll hear something more from him about that. So please, welcome Chris. Good morning, everybody. Um, a, a couple, before I get into my talk, I have a couple of, of comments to follow up from what Edmund had discussed. Um, you know, he, he, he brought up a couple of points um, with data showing that 11.7% of students ages 16 to 24 in the UK self-disclose a disability of some kind. But I would encourage you to consider that that number is significantly higher, particularly because students don't typically self-disclose. The ones that are self-disclosing their disability are the ones that actually, uh, I, I would make the argument, are the ones that, that need the resources to, uh, to be successful. There are a lot of students who are trying to blend in, to um, accomplish uh, higher education without self-disclosing. They're trying to be, uh, in other words, quote-unquote, normal. Um, and they don't want that disability to become part of, um, of their identity. So I would, I would make the argument that 11.7 is significantly low of a number. And we're actually targeting a much larger population of students and individuals. So as I continue to talk about what I'm going to bring up, I want you to consider the fact that everything that we're doing, what we're trying to do, what we're trying to accomplish, anything that we design, anything that we produce, uh, any way or style or strategies that we use for instruction um, are actually including everyone, not the 11.7 percent of students that are actually self-disclosing. You know, and another question that he brought up, and it was a question, should we be asking people to self-disclose an impairment, whether it be for a classroom, whether it be for a conference or a meeting? And the answer to that, from my perspective, is, is, uh, is very adamantly no. We should not be asking them to self-disclose a disability. We should be asking them to self-disclose any um, necessary accommodations or requirements. We're not asking them to self-identify because we don't really identify ourselves whenever we sign up for a conference, we sign up for a conference. We sign up for a class, we sign up for those things. But if there are things that we need to be successful, we ask for those things. And it's not necessarily saying, I'm asking for this because. No, I'm just asking for this. So. Keep in mind that when we ask for those kinds of things for people to self-disclose back to us, that we need to keep that on a positive, not necessarily asking them why you need it. So, um, and, and then to add to that, one last thing is that why we are asking, why we're making these decisions, if you look and, and what's, what's comical about it is we're really never uh, asking for participation from the population we're trying to assist. For the most part, we've got these able-bodied individuals or physically abled individuals who are making decisions for those who are not. We don't have the perspective that they have. Why are we trying to make the decision for them? So just a few thoughts. Thank you for the intro. Uh, I apologize ahead of time for my presentation. I know that there are several instances of misspelling. Uh, Allison could only help me as far as my my title slide. Everything is spelled from the United States and not from the UK, so forgive me. Forgive me. Um, as, as I proceed through the, the talk here, I want you to kind of, I want you to be very reflective of a lot of things that I bring up. I'm going to bring up some theory. Um, I want to share with you a few examples of things that I've worked on. Um, some with uh, other folks who are in the room as well. Um, 
but I want you to be very reflective on it and, and, and consider it from the approach of, of what is most important from the things that we're developing and creating and presenting for all of our students, what is most important? So I'll talk to you about uh, the rigor and, and the aspect of, of retention with that. So let's look at disability from both uh, the American standpoint and the United Kingdom. We each have a statement that discusses what disability is. And as you see, it's pretty similar. It's pretty similar. We're doing the right thing here. Right? It's substantially limiting a major life activity, bottom line. However, if you were to go to Google and type in disability or disabled, you get all of these words. Are they positive? And just to show you a few that really stand out. I think it's a lot more negative focused than what uh, something that substantially limits a major life activity in our statements, right? So I think it is a cultural perspective that somebody with a disability is very disadvantaged for, uh, to pick out a word here, or incompetent or powerless, or unable, or disqualified. These are the terms that define disability. But again, it's a matter of perspective, right? As it should be. The geosciences, very field-oriented. If you do another Google search for field work in the geosciences, these are exemplar images that show up. If you post these in which so there's a study by Julie Sexton um, who has studied the appearance of geoscience websites, university websites, and the images that are put up there are images very similar to this. Do you think that if you, if you use a wheelchair, you're going to say, that's the science for me? Maybe. So we realize that through the geosciences that the field work is the key requirement to complete an undergraduate program. Regardless of where you go, there are field components, right? It's well documented in the literature. It goes way back that field-based experiences are quite necessary. And I know at some of the other talks as well today, you're going to hear that that field component is very necessary to completing an undergraduate program and continuing on in graduate studies in the geosciences. But then looking at the identity of the individual as a geoscientist, as a practicing geoscientist, what are we leaving out? It's profoundly shaped by field study, but in doing so it's profoundly marginalizing individuals who aren't able to adequately complete those field study requirements. We are marginalizing our population just by our own requirements. And so I want you to consider what that looks like in terms of what are, what is most important? What are the learning objectives that we are presenting to students through field work and can they be done differently? This, these are images of what we should be able to accomplish. And I will show you plenty more. I know Allison's going to show you some more today, too. Of what inclusive geoscience looks like. So I'm going to talk to you today about rigor. Spelled correctly, I might add that there are two aspects of rigor. And this is really starting to show up more and more in a lot of the accessible opportunities that we're presenting. We've got physical rigor and academic rigor. If I were to, uh, to look at 
the definition of rigor, which, stand, which, which states that it's a difficult and unpleasant condition or experiences that are associated with something. A condition that makes life difficult, challenging, or uncomfort, uncomfortable, especially extremity of cold. Well, I think back to my field camp, and it wasn't cold. It was quite opposite. All right? So if we look at the concept of rigor, it doesn't sound fun, first of all, does it? doesn't sound fun. But if we look at the concept of rigor as it applies to field-based learning, as it applies to education, what it comes down to is that it's all we've always done it this way. Why are we not? Why wouldn't we continue to do it this way? You know, I think back to when I completed my field camp. It was in Tennessee, in the mountains of Tennessee, which was completely covered with vegetation, and we're climbing mountains looking for an outcrop or we're looking for a contact zone. Sometimes we had to dig through the vegetation and the poison ivy and a hornet's nest that I unfortunately found to find a contact zone. What did I learn from that? I learned that geology sucks, right? As I'm being stung repeatedly by these hornets that didn't want me there either, right? But the point is, is that there is an aspect, if we're looking at it from a rigorous standpoint, we're looking at it from the wrong perspective. There's an aspect, if you, any of you have been on a field trip or led a field trip, you know that sometimes not all the students are, are mentally there. I remember a field trip that I went on, uh, one of, my, one of my, my, uh, my peers, one of my classmates, we were at a rock outcrop, it was a, a sequence stratigraphy trip, and there were so many bugs swarming this on the side of the road that one of my classmates was beside himself with all these bugs on him. He was not paying attention to what we were there to study. It's, that, it's an aspect of cognitive load, all right? The cognitive load, it's just the total amount of mental effort that we put into any given thing. There are three aspects. The manner in which the content is presented, the effort committed to learning the task, to the learning task, and the active process that we put into place for the, to establish working memory. There's so much involved in a field trip that for you to actually focus on the content and get something from that content might not always happen. And this is inherently more difficult for someone who has a disability. So again, I ask you, what is the objective here? Is the objective to climb the mountain, to dig through poison ivy, to fight the hornets, to find a simple contact zone? Is the contact zone, or is the contact, or the anything that you're looking for, for a structural geology map, is that, is that small task that important? Are you actually going to learn something from doing, from, from going to, that, to those lengths to, to learn something? Is that most important? I would argue against it. So we look at both direct and indirect field-based learning experiences. And this is a graphic, it's not published. I put it together uh, just to kind of get my thoughts together on what I was trying to say. And when you look at any given field-based learning experience, whether it's a virtual or alternative experience or an actual field trip or field course or field camp, there are three things that you're looking at. The amount of engagement that your students have with the content and each other, perhaps the interactive aspects of how you can collect data, how you can analyze that data, what that data actually means to you and what you're learning, and the overall experience. I think this overall experience is what are you taking out of it? What are you taking home? What are you remembering? Are you remembering rocks or are you remembering hornets? So there is a uh, a spectrum of field-based learning experiences from text and images um, that goes back many many years 
As we move forward on the spectrum, you've got video and animations. As we continue to move forward, two-dimensional, three-dimensional virtual environments that Jackie's going to talk about today. I've got an example that I will show you as well. Real-time telepresence that Trevor's working on up at the Open University. And then the actual physical presence of field-based learning, of being out there, tasting the shales, making sure they're not too silty, right? Doing the work at the field site. Now, as you can think, there's this spectrum of field-based learning falls on that same spectrum of rigor. Think about that, 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 they're, that on, the, on the far end where it's very academic, you're going to find these text and images, video and animations, 2D, uh, virtual presence. You're going to find that they're, you're able to reduce the cognitive load to the point where content becomes the primary factor. But then you start to move down the spectrum when you're physically in the field and dealing with an uncontrolled environment with the natural conditions. You have students getting stuck in the mud and they're learning the geology firsthand. So let me give you a, a direct experience. This, this was my uh, doctoral research where I was initially working with a group at the Ohio Supercomputer Center to design a virtual recreation of Mammoth Cave National Park of the historic tour route, which is the most commonly uh, visited tour uh, at Mammoth Cave. Mammoth Cave is, uh, is currently, they currently broke, or they recently broke the 400 mile mark, um, which would be what, 100 and some kilometers? I, I don't know. I don't know. Just work with me here. It's the 400 mile mark. Um, of mapped cave, and they're still finding new cave and new cave. It's the, it's the largest cave in the world, longest cave in the world. Through the process of developing this virtual recreation, I wanted to work with a subset of students who could, who could test the, uh, the effectiveness of this virtual recreation. And I needed to know that these students had never been in a cave before. I wanted, to be, I wanted it to be an authentic experience for them. I I needed to know that they had never visited a cave before. I ended up working with students who, who used wheelchairs and physically took them into Mammoth Cave National Park. That experience has changed my complete outlook. So our idea was that we wanted to hit three stops in the Mammoth Cave system. Our first stop was going to be at, at one of the top, one of the highest points in the system to look over uh, a valley that was completely karst. It looked like a bed sheet that wasn't pulled tight. It was just, it was a, it's a beautiful landscape. The second stop, we wanted to hit the Green River, which would have been the discharge area of the, of the cave system. All right, so you have the recharge. When it rains, all the surface drainage goes into the cave system and it's coming out through the discharge area. And then our third stop would have been in the cave itself. But I did not want it to be an experience for them just to go in and sightsee. All six of these students had never taken a geology course before. They were very new to it. So for three weeks leading up to the trip, on Friday afternoons, we met for a three-hour session and I taught them the basics of geology, including cave geology. Now you can imagine, over nine hours, it's a very condensed course on a Friday afternoon. I had to feed them. But they were glued to the content. Nobody had ever given them the experience before, the opportunity to learn this stuff before. And then knowing that they were going to go into the cave as a result, they were glued to this content. When we were inside the cave, we gave them the materials to map a portion of the cave. That was our major outcome. We wanted to see that they could pick up these tools and actually map the cave. So we divided them up. It was easy. We had three girls and three guys, and we divided them up, and they each went off and mapped their own sections. I always like to show this picture. The girls were really, really organized, and the guys had a little trouble getting started. But they were, and, and I had to give them all headlamps. They had to fit the part. They loved it. It was just an experience that they had never been given before. 
And what they turned out after they got back together, they collected all their data back at the research center. We got they they just they. They, they got right on it. They started drawing, they started working with their, their data to, to create these maps. And what they turned out on the left side was what they drew. The bottom portion of it, this bottom portion was the guys, the top portion was the ladies, and they were completely autonomous. Their data fit together perfectly. As you can see, this is the actual cave site where they were, where they mapped. And it fit together perfectly. They, they've never taken any geology. They've never taken any mapping courses. I didn't even talk to them about mapping in the three class sessions. But yet, it came together for them. It really was an experience that they'll never forget, as you can see. They will never forget that. taking students in wheelchairs into a site that most people would commonly steer away from is possible. It's possible. There's proof. Now, were there barriers? Of course there were barriers. There were a lot of barriers. A lot of barriers. This was a year and a half of planning, which steers a lot of people away from actually doing this. Right? Was it cheap? It cost us some money, too. So I get it. A year and a half of planning. The logistical, personal, financial, medical, administrative barriers that we had to overcome and make sure that we were accommodating along the way. The list goes on. This, I mean, if, this, if I tried to be all-encompassing of what all we had to, to, to deal with along the way, there are things that, that probably aren't on this list as well. So how do you do this? How, are you, how would you be able to repeatedly offer something like this for students? So our learning objectives. We wanted to make sure that we varied the levels of in inquiry. We wanted students to be engaged with the content. We wanted them to bring their uh, curiosity and their inquisitiveness to this. We wanted them to, we wanted them to soak up everything from, from their, their perspective. We wanted them to be able to explore and to map. We wanted them to learn about the geomorphology of the cave system. None of these objectives dealt with physical rigor. That was not our primary concern. That was the least of our concerns. Although we dealt with it several times. Some parts of the cave, some of my students who had the heavier chairs with the big batteries found soft spots in the sand and we dealt with a whole lot of other problems when they couldn't get out of that sand and we had to push them out. Feelings of entrapment, um, things that I would have never had thought of occurred, which lets you know that flexibility is completely necessary when you're designing something like this. All right? But physical rigor was farthest from our, from our ideas. And I'll put these up that, that this shows that you have students that come together. None of the six students knew each other. I think there were some that, that knew of each other, but they didn't know each other. They were all from the same university. They didn't know each other. But as a result of this experience and sharing the perspectives that they shared, they came together. And I can't stress to you enough the importance of establishing a learning community. That learning community, what you'll see in the next example that I share with you, is the most important aspect. If you have students that are able to work together, to talk together, to learn together, they get so much more out of the experience. And so they felt that this was so focused on disability that it wasn't um, it wasn't focused on their disability, it was focused on their abilities. It was focused on their abilities to learn, to participate, to actively engage with the content, with the instructors, and with one another. Those are the things that we should be focusing on. The bottom quote here, how can we get people to understand that you're completely able-bodied, making a decision for me, and you have no idea what I can and can't do? 
That's what we're facing. I'm trying to make decisions for people that I have no perspective on. I, I don't walk in their shoes. So why am, I, why am I trying to do this without actually getting their perspective, getting their input? Tell me what you can do. This is what I want you to learn. How can, how can we design this to allow you to learn it? So I wanted to go through this really quickly. You know, we realized that getting students physically in the cave is a difficult thing. It's not something that we're going to be able to continue to do. So then we started to work with this virtual recreation, which was the original plan for my dissertation. So let me get back to that real quick. There were four stops along the cave. There, were, there are four levels in the Mammoth Cave system. Four stops, primary content stops, and two different levels. Some of these were clearly not accessible. This is my daughter when she was three years old. That's a three-year-old body in the passageway that I had to contort myself to get through, quite aptly known as Fat Man's Misery at Mammoth Cave on the historic tour route. She had a great time. It was, see, this, is, this is designed specially for me. You can't get a wheelchair in there. So we went back. We collected LiDAR scan data of the entire tour route. We went back and we actually collected imagery because the LiDAR scan data doesn't give you the, the actual pictures or doesn't give you fine detail of the scalloping that you see here that is a great representation. This is called Leopard's Arch, aptly known, Leopard's Arch. Great representation of the scalloping that shows you flow rate and direction. Very important when you're talking about cave and karst. It's another image of it, with my head for scale, of the larger scalloping. So we took those images and stitched those together and we're able to integrate these images into the scan data. So as you can imagine, a LiDAR scan of a mile and a half worth of cave is a lot of data. So we weren't able to get really fine detail on the entire cave, but specific areas we were able to put this fine detail scan, or the, the imagery, the pictures that we've taken, high res pictures, and stitch those into the, the data itself. There's another part here. And, and this is, these are anastomoses that you would be able to look at in a cave. When you get to this part in the virtual representation, you have complete control of pulling it out and rotating it in any direction that you'd want to be able to analyze this. But in the actual virtual setting, it's, there's not a whole lot of that uh, high-res imagery. So this is just a, a, an, an image of what the virtual cave looks like. The structure of this cave is completely accurate. This is a, excuse me, this is an early rendition of our cave. So it doesn't have any of the actual um, texture or coloring that the, that the cave does. But you can, you can go through this. The problem that you, that you see right here is that this doesn't do the scale justice you can get multiple tractor trailers in this passageway. It's large. And it's being able to represent that scale, very difficult. All right, so in extending this virtual representation, the opportunities for using these virtual environments to learn from is that, like I said before, we had four passage, four levels of cave passage in Mammoth Cave. We focused on two of them, the upper and the lower, the A and the B. If you were to overlay the topographical, the surface topography with what is below the cave, what you would see is that you would start getting an understanding for what's occurring on the surface. Typically, you go into a cave, you have no idea what's going on ahead of, uh, above you. So you're able to overlay the surface topos with the cave map itself and understand that one of the passageways that's really, really wet on one side of the wall which is causing all the carbonate formation on the other side of the wall is on, on a, a, a side of a valley on the surface. But you would never be able to know that unless you had that virtual representation of it, if you actually had the maps that you could work with. 
this is what we're being able to integrate into a virtual setting. In addition to this, the Mammoth Cave Park, when it was first, um, when it was first discovered, well, I should say when it was discovered, it was discovered by the Native Americans, and that was 10,000 years ago. They didn't really keep good records. But when it was discovered, they actually had slaves who were the tour guides. They employed the slaves. I shouldn't say employed, I guess, right? They used the slaves as tour guides. This is Matt Bransford around the 1838. He was one of the original tour guides of Mammoth Cave National Park. We've created him as an avatar who is inside the virtual cave speaking to you. What's even better is we're still working on this, though, that Matt's great-great-grandson, Jerry, is a current park ranger at Mammoth Cave. And we're going to use his voice to speak. So he's actually speaking from his great-great-grandfather's perspective. That's all integrated into this virtual setting. All right, so developmental roadblocks for actually doing this. Time, expense, depiction of representation and scale, the user control, um, interacting. That list goes on and on, too. But once that's developed, the usability of this is endless. Right? Getting the people that know what they're doing, getting Trevor involved or getting Jackie involved that know what they're doing to put things like this together uh, is, is a big deal. And it's something that is usable. I mean, how many folks in the UK have ever been to Mammoth Cave National Park? Yet all of you could go virtually. At Georgia State University, which was my last university, they have a, a series in, this, in the room. They have what's called the visualization wall. And I know it's spelled wrong. Forgive me. But at this wall, you turn off all the lights and you're physically focused on an environment. I mean, this is a wall that, would, that probably stretches the length of this wall up here. And it's a curved, it's not a cave, like a three-walled cave, but it's a curved um, set of, of monitors that allow you to be uh, engaged into an environment. This is one of those ways of, of being able to, to put something like the virtual Mammoth Cave experience up and have people really focused and feeling like they're actually there. So let me share with you this last experience here, and, and I'm not going to talk too much about it because I know Allison is. This past, this past fall uh, in Vancouver, British Columbia, Allison and I and a couple of our colleagues put together a uh, direct field experience for specifically for students and faculty to come together in a way to discuss accessibility, to discuss content and the intersection of both. What can we be doing better? All right, and we had both students and faculty with disabilities on that, on that trip. Edmund was on the trip with us as well. But like I said before, the primary thing was to get people together and talk to them about their abilities. Tell me what you, tell me what you, what you know, what you can do, what you're interested in doing. Now, at this point, most of the trip was planned out, but we did make changes. It's remaining flexible, being able to remain flexible to make changes on the fly according to what your students can and cannot do. You, don't say, you should not stay so rigid that this is what we're doing and we're not going to change it just simply because if you can't do it, then you're just going to have to sit out. That's not the way to go. You change according to what your students can do. This was one of our stops, and as you can see, there's a floodplain here, a very rocky floodplain. A few of our students, a few of our participants, not just students, were not able to actually go down onto the floodplain. That's okay. That wasn't the focus of our trip. Most, a lot of us stayed back. Edmund's there photobombing. <laughs> a lot of us stayed back and actually discussed the environment, discussed the location discussed what was happening, the geology. We had a great discussion, and it didn't need to be down on the floodplain for that. That wasn't the focus. People came back, and they brought samples from things that they'd found on the floodplain, hand samples to share with everybody. But as you can see, this was the focus, and no one in our group was getting there. Because the stop itself, 
the location wasn't the focus. It was being very close to what we were seeing up here and seeing in the rocks on the floodplain that were able to be brought back to the entire group. That was the focus. Everybody had access to this. This is a, this is a great example of two individuals, one with an apparent disability, one with a non-apparent disability, working together. That learning community was coming together and we didn't force it. We didn't force that learning community. It happened. You gave them an op we gave them an opportunity to come together and to learn together and share experiences, share prior experiences. And, and our participants flourished. This was another spot that enabled everybody to, to, to see the environment for what it was. This is a great stop. This was our last stop on the day uh, with these glacial striations. It was beautiful. But you give them a, get, you stop at a place and you talk about the, the entire location. And this was a perfect stop because people could get right up on it and feel it and touch the striations. We had a couple of people with visual disabilities who were able to really get a good observation of this site, as you can see. There's Edmund photobombing again. I think that's all he did. He watched, walked around looking for people taking pictures. <laughs> uh, what's that? Probably. Another great opportunity that, that typically doesn't occur. Getting up and actually feeling things firsthand, seeing things. This one down here I wanted to show you because I ruined this picture. And I'll tell you why. What's happening here is we have an individual who's usually, we, we, we put together tactile maps with different, different, different uh, materials. And in this picture, I said, hey, hold that to where it looks like you're using it. You know, I wanted to get a picture, but I ruined it. Because she said, when I actually, right before I asked her, I took a picture. I said, hey, hold that. I want, you, I want you to look like you're using it. And she said, I was using it. This is how she's using it. Because if you have a vis visual disability, you don't have to look at it to feel it. There's my perspective. There's my naive misconception of somebody using a tactile map. I had no idea. And the longer that I participate in things like this, I learn something every single time. I don't know at all. So what were our learning objectives from this Vancouver trip? Again, demonstrate guided inquiry and inclusive instructions, the geomorphology of Vancouver's fire and ice, the history of fire and ice. Our goals were to identify and document best practices for faculty learning how to prepare in accessible field experiences and identify and document uh, how to accommodate students with diverse physical and sensory disabilities on a field experience. As Allison will point out, we had 15 students. 14 of them had a doctor, a self-disclosed disability. We had 15 faculty, and four of those faculty self-disclosed a disability. It was a great experience to bring those, to, those two groups together. As you can see from these quotes, uh, everybody was on the same page. Everybody felt like they were equal. Everybody felt like they had something to provide. They felt like their perspective was valued. And the last quote here was from one of our faculty participants who over time was no longer able to get into the field. And that's, that's powerful. That's, that's, a, that's a great feeling. So what does all this mean? First, consider your objectives. If your objective is for this, get your students to go up to the top of the mountain just because you did it, just because you were taught to do that, I think you're missing the mark. If we create things to, en to enable multiple perspectives, to, it promotes scientific innovation. We've got a lot of folks that have a lot of perspective, unique perspective that they can use and we're not pulling that out. What we're doing is we're pulling the same perspective out in our discipline. Everybody has the same perspective because everybody's done it the exact same way. That's an issue. One of the big cool, one of the cool things that's really about to start taking off is looking at data through multiple perspectives. 
seismic data that's being represented through sound is something that's really going to start taking off. Not just seismic data, but a lot of different types of data that you'll listen to. Some of you may have seen how the climate data, you might have heard or you might have saw a YouTube video about climate data being represented through uh, instruments, through sound. And you can, you can hear and you can feel the drastic difference from when they started collecting climate data to where it is today. From the really, really low, deep, soothing sounds to high-pitched sounds that really make it feel like you're, there's something wrong. But yet, you can look at it on a, on a diagram and you're not going to get that same feeling. <coughs> the same with any other types of data that can be represented that way. Why are we not looking at perspectives like this? I will be around. I'll talk about the IAGD. For those of you, there's several people in here that are members of the IAGD. The IAGD is an organization of, it's a network of people who are attempting to create awareness and accessibility. Not, tip, not specifically for individuals with disabilities, for everybody. It's for everybody. It's a network, it's an international network. It's completely free to be a part of. If you go to the website, there's a link that says join today. I encourage you guys to join today. It just puts you in the community. I really appreciate being brought here. I thank you, I thank you. Uh, and if there, I'm, like I said, I'll be around here all day. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. Yes, sir. If I may, um, my name is Wayne Gladwin. Uh, do we have a, do we have, I know we wanted to wait for a microphone. Uh, I can say it live, it's okay. <laughs> well, well, we're being recorded. Uh, my name is Wayne Gladwin. Is it in um, there? There it is. I've worked 20 years in the outdoor education industry and for the last seven years in the geoscience training industry. Um, I was born and raised in terms as they know it's scalping <laughs> and uh, that's fantastic. Uh, what I'd like to do actually is challenge you a little. Um, you said right at the start that uh, we shouldn't disclose but look for requirements. As a leader and as a uh, uh, provider of geoscience uh, courses, I'd say the two were actually the same. And it's a question of semantics of terminology. Probably so. But you said some wonderful words in your presentation about, I'm naive. How should I achieve the aims if it's not participant-centric on what their goals and aims are mm -hmm. without being in their shoes or sitting in their chair? Actually, I'd say that the, the culture of disclosure is actually not important but essential to allow that to happen and so I'd actually encourage, I'd ask you to reconsider and say uh, disclosure is essential. So I, I, I would agree with you completely and I think the thing that I would agree most is that we need to establish that culture like you're saying that it's it's not a negative perspective that I think that it's been such a culture of negativity for so long that people are very reluctant to disclose that. And so the current culture as it stands, we're asking them to disclose and it still feels very negative, right? So once we get to that point, that's certainly not gonna happen overnight. We can do this for decades and it's still, gonna, it's still not gonna to solve that. But once we get to that, that, that point where it is no longer negative, self-disclosure is a moot point. Right? It, it becomes just, it's, it's the community. It's normal. Right. Right. Very good point. Yes, sir. Uh, just on the, the point of disclosure. Let me, let, me, let me stop you for a minute because they're recording this oh, okay. and we want to try and get it on, uh, on the mics if it's, if it's working. I, I appreciate it. 
Um, on the point of disclosure, there's, in UK law, there's an anticipatory element for publicly funded organisations in terms of accessibility. I think I'm right here. Correct me yeah. if I'm wrong. And Alison's going to speak in detail <laughs> about that as well. So this is pretty challenging for, for universities because within the budget constraints, we've, we've basically got to be adapted for any student that might come through the door. Mm -hmm. And in practice, what it means is that we adapt very quickly when a student comes through the door at the point of disclosure. But going back to your original point that disclosure is perhaps not as enlightened as it could be and it, and it associates a person's identity back with a disability, legally, they shouldn't need to disclose because we should be prepared for it anyway. Um, but the cost implications of some of the activities you've talked about and the time implications yeah. to set them up are, are the challenge for us. So I, I think to, to respond to that very quickly, one, that Allison's going to spend a lot of time talking about those constraints. But from my perspective, if we're designing them universally, if we're designing them for the, for the end user in mind, regardless of what they might need, I think it, it, it minimizes those, those financial barriers completely. If the, the main issue that I think that we have is that we are, for the most part, a group of geoscientists who are not educationally trained who are not trained as instructors, they're trained scientists for the most part, who have never had to deal with how to use different instructional strategies to accommodate students. So it might be a fact that we need to focus on more of where you find resources because you're right. You might not know that you have a student come, uh, that, had, that, had, that needs accommodations until they show up to your first class. And then you panic, and, and then you, you try to get by, and it's usually not very successful. So if we're training our faculty how to find resources, how to use instructional accommodations, how to network with other people who have done that, I think you're going to be able to start breaking some of those barriers down um, without needing a lot of the financial support that the UK is going to start losing. I agree. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh. Yep, yep, yep. Good. Thank you all.